tonight, two days from his coronation, Charles meets indigenous leaders right here at Buckingham Palace. One of my elders who said that relationships are built over 100 cups of tea. And today we had our first cup of tea. We'll look at the optimism and the skepticism. On interference from China, Melanie Jolie is under fire. So we haven't no, expelled no, Michael, a single Michael, PRC can... diplomat. Rosie and that issue are here. Why Ed Sheeran's copyright victory is also a win for the music business. I really feel like he's trying to say you can't copyright Boy Meets Girl. This is The National in London with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. We're just outside Buckingham Palace tonight as the countdown to the King's coronation shifts from days to hours. But even at this busy time, today the King made room for a historic meeting. He invited three Indigenous leaders from Canada for a talk at the palace. It was a big moment inside a critical one. As people pour into London, a lot of speculation about how Charles might move the monarchy in new directions. And that includes the Crown's relationship with Indigenous peoples. Rene Filipponi sat down with the three leaders after their meeting to get their thoughts on how it went. It was a historic moment as the King welcomed Indigenous leaders to Buckingham Palace. There was no apology, no decree, but the leaders say it was the start of a conversation. One of my elders who said that relationships are built over 100 cups of tea, and today we had our first cup of tea to build that relationship. To First Nations, Métis and Inuit leaders were clear about what they wanted the King to know. Well, we talk mostly about treaty and our treaty relationship with the Crown, that these treaties predate Canada as a country. And that relationship is one that we have to evolve. Missing and murdered Indigenous women, residential schools, and the repatriation of cultural artifacts were also on the agenda. All three leaders will be in Westminster Abbey for the coronation. Uh, we belong here. We belong at the coronation. We belonged at the funeral uh, ceremony for the Queen. Because of that long historic relationship, we must listen to the truth of the lived experiences of Indigenous peoples. On his trip to Canada last year, King Charles said he and Camilla left with heavy hearts. Today was still about listening. So I think he has a, a baseline understanding of the negative effects of colonization uh, on uh, First Nations, Inuit and Métis in Canada. What we do about that, I think, is a new conversation and how he, in his role as the as king, could use his influence to work with us on reconciliation efforts. This Indigenous scholar points out talk is not action. Unfortunately, the crown has not listened in the past, so I don't have a lot of optimism that this crown or this king will listen. At the same time, this king has shown more interest than his mother. Outside the palace, the decorated mall is a draw for many visiting for the coronation. The Grand Chief of Manitoba, Kiwetanawi Okimakinak, is one of them. I think that uh, I'm here because of my ancestors. For him, this represents past wrongs. He's here hoping for a better future. I'm here because of the, uh, the faith that they had in the treaties and that they believed that the treaties would be respected and they were not. But I'm here to represent them and I hope that those treaties are recognized at this stage. Thank you. Renee, maybe a bit of a strange question, but do we know the king's thoughts here? Well, his thoughts are coming from his representative in Canada, Governor General Mary Simon. She's the first Indigenous person ever to hold this position, and she helped coordinate this meeting. Now, in a statement, she says the king understands the importance of walking the path of reconciliation and how these discussions are so vital and that they're going to start slowly and will form the pillars of a renewed relationship with Indigenous peoples built on respect and understanding. All right, Renee, thank you. I had a conversation with the Governor General just after those meetings happened, and I asked then how she would characterize it. The national leaders agreed that they didn't want to just lay on the table. These are the demands, mm -hmm. because there's the, relationship have, the relationship has to be 
uh, has to be built. This is the first time that a royal has actually met with three indigenous national leaders that are elected by their people. So it was, it was a moment in history, really. And where do you take this moment? I was kind of the moderator in some ways in, in the conversation, uh, but I see myself as continuing to take this lead when I get back to Canada. We'll have more of that conversation tomorrow as our coverage from London continues. And on Saturday, we'll bring you the King's Coronation live. I'll be hosting the CBC News special coverage from here at Buckingham Palace starting at 4 a.m. Eastern. Ian will be outside Westminster Abbey. You can watch on CBC TV, CBC News Network, Explore and Gem. Now back in Canada, the government says it's looking into the potential consequences of expelling the diplomat at the centre of allegations of foreign interference. But as Rafi Bujikanian explains, this comes amid new allegations and new threats by China. The pre-committee pleasantries between Melanie Joly and Michael Chong were cordial but short-lived. When did you first find out that a PRC diplomat was targeting me and my family? Uh, I've learned it through the news. Why do you, Minister, continue to allow this diplomat to be accredited in this country on Canadian soil? The conflict sparked by a Globe and Mail story on Monday, citing a two-year-old CSIS document and a national security source alleging a China diplomat threatened Chong's family over his strong stance against China's human rights violations. But Chong wasn't made aware. We haven't expelled a single PRC diplomat. Right now, as a government, is we're assessing the consequences that we'll be facing in case of diplomatic expulsion. Because While the political pressure keeps piling up, new allegations surrounding the spy agency's document in question period. The Prime Minister denying until now it had ever left CSIS, but Chong says Trudeau's national security advisor made top civil servants aware. This contradicts what the Prime Minister said yesterday. He said CSIS made the determination that it wasn't something that needed to be raised to a higher level. We have been asking those very intelligence agencies those kind of questions. What do we need to have as a national government to reassure parliamentarians and Canadians? This observer says the Chinese diplomat needs to be shown the door. He should have been on the plane on Monday night. And the fact that we're sitting here Thursday afternoon and that we're still talking about it is really concerning. China's ambassador was summoned by Ottawa. Afterwards, he denied accusations of meddling, calling this matter a political farce and threatening retribution. Jolie says she'll make a decision about the diplomat very soon. Rafi Bujikan, CBC News, Ottawa. We have much more on this story in about 20 minutes when Rosie and the Ad Issue panel will break down a busy week in Ottawa. Tonight, more than a month after eight people drowned in the St. Lawrence community of Akwesasne, police in India have laid charges linked to the incident. And a man has come forward in India with allegations that loved ones were led astray by a deceptive and disastrous human smuggling operation. The Fifth Estate, Stephen D'Souza, has the details. Ashwin Chaudhry opened up to police in the Indian state of Gujarat about the tragic events that he says led to the drowning of his brother Pravin and Pravin's family in the St. Lawrence in March. Ashwin says his brother was already in Canada when the family was contacted by a man in India, promising, with the help of a partner in Canada, to smuggle them into the U.S. He says they were told the plan was to cross overland by taxi. Ashwin scrambled to raise close to $100,000 Canadian. That bought the Chaudhry family passage through Winnipeg and Montreal to the edge of the St. Lawrence. Ashwin says his brother then waited in the area for almost a week, told it wasn't clear to cross. Then the plan changed. They were told they wouldn't have to go in the water, but then they went by boat. Ashwin says his brother initially refused, but the smugglers insisted it would be safe. Rescue crews found their bodies hours after Ashwin says both his brother and niece contacted him from the boat, saying something was wrong. Ashwin laid out his story in a complaint filed with Indian police. Details, he says, came from constant calls with his brother and the smugglers. 
Indian police are now searching for three men, including one allegedly in Canada. The dream of living in the U.S. has led thousands to leave Gujarat and attempt dangerous crossings using human smugglers. This member of Canada's Gujarati community hopes this new information sends a message about human smuggling. Hey, listen, what has happened with us, with our family, you know, is my brother is not going to come back or his family, but you don't do it. CBC News shared these new details with police in Aguasasne, who are reviewing the information as their investigation continues. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Toronto. A large, out-of-control wildfire has prompted evacuations from a northern Alberta community. These pictures are from near Fox Lake. Thousands have fled their homes. Hot, dry conditions are expected to continue. Right now, there are more than 60 active wildfires burning in the province, putting hundreds under evacuation orders. British pop superstar Ed Sheeran has been found not liable after a closely watched music copyright trial. Sheeran was accused of replicating key elements of a Marvin Gaye 70s classic. Deanna Sumanak Johnson on the verdict and how it is reverberating in the music world. Ed Sheeran claiming vindication in New York. I want to thank the jury for making the decision that will help protect the creative process of songwriters here in the United States and all around the world. A jury there ruled no plagiarism went into one of his most recognizable hits. Darling, I will be loving you till we're 70. The lawyers for heirs of Ed Townsend, who co-wrote Marvin Gaye's Let's Get It On, argued unsuccessfully that Sheeran stole chords or feel of the 1973 song. There were parallels between them in a technical way, but I don't think there were enough similarities to constitute um, a substantial similarity, which is what the law protects or um, defends in this case. It was a claim Sheeran called insulting and ludicrous over and over again while on the stand, a slippery slope to more lawsuits based on less and less merit. Some experts agree. I am incredibly relieved. Common sense has finally prevailed in the music business um, and with regard to copyright. Well, I really feel like he's trying to say you can't copyright boy meets girl and this, you know, enough. I've heard enough of this. The vibe, definitely. But for other songwriters working today, like this hit maker for the likes of Justin Bieber, the risk remains. You know, when I'm in the room with songwriters writing, immediately... We're all looking at it through the lens of, has this been done before? Um, has this melody been done before? Has this lyric been done before? We Finding ways to ensure that inspiration doesn't, even accidentally, lead to imitation, then litigation. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. A Washington jury has convicted four members of the far-right extremist group known as the Proud Boys on charges of seditious conspiracy. Specifically, conspiring to oppose by force the lawful transfer of presidential power. Former Proud Boys leader Enrique Tarrio and three other Proud Boys face up to 20 years on that charge alone for their role in the violence at the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021. A fifth co-defendant was acquitted. A fighting is being reported on the streets of Sudan's capital tonight despite a new ceasefire. As David Common shows us from Nairobi, the conflict is worsening a humanitarian crisis throughout the entire region. This is a measure of Sudan's pain, a simple test which reveals acute malnutrition. Sudan was not in good shape before the war. Now the chronically hungry must find the energy to flee it. Arriving in struggling South Sudan, the diagnosis is clear. These new arrivals are extremely vulnerable. At Sudan's other end is Egypt, a journey now considered extremely dangerous. Still, thousands are using every resource to make it. They're tired sleeping on the streets, in the mosques and in the schools, says this man. But reaching a border is no guarantee of crossing it. Most will be turned back, 
Khartoum is still the scene of the fiercest fighting, but the army is also bombing the rival militia in its stronghold, the West. The fear is that the instability will spread to Chad, the Central African Republic, and South Sudan. Adding to the mayhem, Russia is delivering weapons to the militia. Meanwhile, here in Nairobi, we're hearing terrifying tales of escape from those who left Sudan and are now here on their way to Canada. They don't want to speak on camera because they're concerned it would impact their immigration case, but they talk about gunmen at checkpoints all the way to the airport and sleeping for days on the ground, not knowing if they'd make it out on a military airlift. Just yesterday, the UN Secretary General visiting Africa told us he was hopeful but not confident a ceasefire could be struck. Today, though, the UN aid chief said neither Sudanese general fighting each other for control want to stop that fighting. So the ceasefire set to start this morning never did. Some foreign citizens had still been able to escape by military airlift, but the British ended their mission today. Many, though, have nowhere to go, no idea of whether they'll ever return home. David Common, CBC News, Nairobi. The person in charge of enforcing Canada's Accessibility Act is now under investigation himself. Ashley Burke has more on the allegations and what's being done about them. A year ago, the government called its appointment of Canada's first accessibility commissioner historic. Now Michael Gottile is the subject of an independent investigation. According to documents viewed by CBC News, last November, some employees alleged that Gautel mistreated staff. In response, the Canadian Human Rights Commission told employees it was putting a series of protective measures in place, including that meetings with the commissioner would be virtual and wouldn't be one-on-one. -on -one. I was made aware of the situation in January, so I tasked my department uh, to look into it. They have moved expeditiously. The Justice Minister's department has now hired an Ottawa firm to investigate. I took it seriously. We need to have a fair process uh, that, that respects the, the rights of everyone involved. That followed a March letter from employees questioning the time it was taking to hire an investigator. The letter viewed by CBC News said, in that time we have lost three people in critical management positions. These losses are either wholly or in large part due to the behavior of Mr. Gautile and the toxic impact he has had on our work environment. Additionally, at least two remaining individuals are considering leaving the commission due to the psychologically unsafe and difficult work environment. In a statement, Gottel said, I was not aware of the new allegations you have raised. In any event, allegations should be investigated, and a fair, impartial, and comprehensive process is the appropriate way to do so. Gottel also says his understanding is that there is no formal complaint against him. He says he's dedicated his career to promoting and protecting accessibility, human rights, and fairness for all Canadians, and that he will fully cooperate with the investigation. According to emails, the third party is starting interviews next week. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Back here in London, a costly coronation some hope will pay off. Will it be a boost or a bust for business? It's been a tough couple of years for pups with the pandemic. The Trudeau government under pressure to act after more allegations of interference by China. We're assessing different options, including the expulsion of diplomats. Rosie is here with that issue. But first, honoring the princess of Star Wars on a fitting day. My mom is a double whammy, a Pez dispenser and has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame now. We're back in two. More than 35,000 striking workers are now back on the job at Canada Revenue Agency. A tentative deal would raise their pay 12.6% over four years. There are also provisions for deciding on remote work. This is the latest proposed settlement in a string of federal job actions. And Shopify is laying off 20% of its workforce. That's about 2,300 workers. It's the e-commerce giant's second mass round of layoffs in just under a year. Last July, the Ottawa-based company made a 10% cut. Here in the UK, there are some who resist celebrating as the coronation of King Charles approaches. Class divisions can now seem especially stark across his kingdom. 
Margaret Evans shows us how the Royals reach out and try to stay relevant. Call it a pregame strategy for the coronation. The Prince and Princess of Wales dispatched for a few photo ops, taking the tube, no less, en route to a Soho pub called the Dog and Duck. <laughs> William pulled the first pint of Kingmaker's Ale, created in honour of his father. The hospitality sector hoping to cash in over the coronation weekend. It's been a tough couple of years for pubs with the pandemic, people working from home. Britain is also currently in the midst of a biting cost of living crisis. British taxpayers won't know just how much the coronation is going to cost them until after it's all over. Buckingham Palace insists it's worth the return, both in terms of global prestige and maybe in an economic boost for pubs like the ones they've just visited. Tourism numbers are also expected to jump. 30,000 more foreign visitors to London than you'd normally see this time of year. We decided that this would be a really great opportunity to come and see a very historic moment. We enjoy the theatre, we enjoy the, the pomp and all of that. I mean, we do see the other side of it. The palace says it is economizing in line with the times. King Charles guest list, for example, 2,000 strong, compared to over 8,000 at his mother's coronation. And they've issued releases about reupholstering throne chairs and recycling ceremonial gloves. But that doesn't translate very well at charities helping people cope with an inflation rate of 10% and energy bills that have doubled. The United Kingdom has a very big issue with class, massive issue. Joshua Monroe volunteers for his uncle at an East London charity. They collect surplus food from supermarkets and get it to 37 other hubs. His uncle was even rewarded for his work by the Queen. But Monroe says the monarchy has much work to do. If they find ways to connect with all British people in modern Britain, then maybe it will survive. It's hard to really see Britain without it, but we might be able to manage it. He's very <laughs> From where he stands, Soho and the dog and duck seem very far away. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. A Hollywood princess is being honoured and remembered. I'm a member of the Imperial Senate on a diplomatic mission to Alderaan. Carrie Fisher played a princess in six Star Wars films, and her parents were movie star royalty. My mom used to say you weren't actually famous until you became a Pez dispenser. Today, Fisher was given a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. That's her daughter accepting it. Fans had called for this for years. It was timed, of course, for today's date. May the 4th be with you. After the break, Rosie's here with that issue. Hey, Rosie. Hi, Adrian. Tonight, we are, of course, going to talk about those latest developments around foreign interference and today's call to expel a foreign diplomat. Why is this diplomat still here, a diplomat who has more rights and immunities than the Canadians around this table, to go around and conduct his foreign interference threat activities. Michael Chong made that appeal to the Foreign Affairs Minister directly. Should Canada do it? And what kind of pushback could they receive? Althea, Chantal and Kelly Kreiderman will join me to talk about that and more. Hi there, I'm Rosemary Barton. Here's what's at issue this week. Conservative MP Michael Chong has been demanding explanations and actions from the government. This comes after reports he and his family overseas were targeted by China and that a Chinese diplomat based in Toronto was part of it. You have given accreditation to a diplomat here who is using his diplomatic immunity to target not just me and my family, but other members of parliament. So why do you, minister, continue to allow this diplomat to be accredited in this country on Canadian soil? I understand your frustration and I understand your anger. So we let, haven't expelled no, no, Michael, a single Michael, PRC I can, diplomat. Can I just we are finish? one of the only democratic Mr. allies Speaker, in the NATO alliance that has not Mr. expelled Chair. a single PRC diplomat. What we're doing right now as a government is we're assessing the consequences that uh, we'll be facing in case of diplomatic expulsion, because there will be consequences. 
The Prime Minister has said he was not aware of the allegations until this week, but has instructed Canada's spy agency to share more information about threats to members of Parliament. Chong says the PM's National Security Advisor did know. So is there an apparent contradiction here and what kind of new questions does that raise? How is the government responding? Should it expel Chinese diplomats linked to foreign interference or attempts uh, for foreign interference? Let's bring in everybody. Chantal Hebert, Althea Raj, and joining us uh, this tonight, Kelly Kreiderman stepping in for Mr. Coyne tonight. Thanks for being <laughs> here, Kelly. Um, Chantal, I'm going to start with you. I, I, I mean, this week obviously started with this story around Michael Chong, which has now become sort of something it seems like the government is, is, is not able to contain. Um, what do you make of what we've heard this week? Well, uh, it would help if one, the government could uh, get a story straight uh, mm -hmm. and two, mm -hmm. uh, manage to keep it straight for more than one day. So having taken two days to assert uh, that neither of them, the prime minister or uh, the minister of public safety, had been where, made aware two years ago of uh, the, the, what uh, was happening to MP Chung. Uh, now today, the National Security Advisor says, oops, uh, CSIS did move the file up uh, to the National Security Advisor. It is possible to believe the Prime Minister, who says he only found out in the newspaper, and to believe that the, uh, uh, that CSIS moved the file up to the National Security Advisor. Mm -hmm. But it's also convenient in the sense that the National Security Advisor who was saying that today, Jody Thomas, was not the person who was sitting in the chair right. when that report was moved up to the National Security Advisor. So uh, in clear, someone somewhere and two or three people sat in that chair because the job was open in the summer of 2021. Someone somewhere did not move it up, but CSIS is saying it's not us, and the Prime Minister is saying it wasn't me either. Yeah. Uh, and, and that makes the government look like it doesn't have its act together. Yeah, it is at the very least, Althea, not a particularly reassuring story for Canadians the way this has unfolded. No, I mean, they clearly took a long time to uh, come to the announcement that they had only learned on Monday. They wanted to clearly be sure that they indeed had only learned on Monday. Um, but to Chantal's point, and there's like a little bit more tick tying to that, like there is the Prime Minister coming out and saying that, well, uh, CSIS didn't put it up the chain of command. And then obviously, as Chantal put it out, we learned that that's not the case uh, on Thursday. But the other thing is the context. The context of July 2021 is the Liberals are getting ready for an election. So was the government distracted? And is that why they were briefed at the time? I think there's a, there are more questions to be asked about what happened. But I think at the core of the question that you asked at, at the outset, um, this is a very, very serious matter. And the Liberals have expulsed diplomats for lesser things, in my opinion. We. Uh, the Liberals showed four diplo Russian diplomats the door. They expulsed a Venezuelan diplomat because a Canadian diplomat had been uh, expulsed for um, talking about human rights issues in Venezuela. So the bar has already been set. And uh, while I don't think the government should be rushing, Milan, usually the Foreign Affairs Minister is right to know, like, what are we putting uh, at stake before we do this? They absolutely have to take a firm line because otherwise they are telling all MPs in the House of Commons that they uh, can be victims of such foreign aggression as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the country is changing. Uh, there are lots of MPs from diaspora communities. If you do not take a firm action, you're basically saying that they can all be sitting ducks or that what you will have are MPs from ethnic communities who are basically spokesmen for their home country. That is obviously not something the government wants either. They're not free to express their own personal opinions. So they absolutely have to take a firm stance. Kelly. Yeah, and that's why it's kind of strange that the Foreign Affairs Minister talked today about whether uh, the, the process and the consequences of expelling a diplomat. And I, I'm, I'm like, why would you talk about what you're contemplating in that detail before you do it? Because there's, it's very difficult to walk that back to, to say it when you've get given such a specific answer. And I think the whole problem with this situation also is we're talking about an MP 
who has been a very uh, uh, effective critic in calling for a serious foreign policy yeah. in Canada for a long time. And he is the one, Michael Chong is the one at the center of this. And he's also someone who uh, is a conservative, but he also has appeal across party lines. And I yeah. think it, it is it is very interesting that this is the person that everything is focused on going to the larger theme of the competence by the Liberals on this file, whether they're taking foreign interference uh, concerns seriously when it has to do with Conservatives, the changing of the story now that we're hearing about today is a big concern, and why wasn't this brought up to the top levels? Was it a distraction, yeah. as Althea mentions, or you know, can the Conservatives make the charge that this is because it's an opposition MP? So I think it, this situation and pertaining to a very pretty particular person, a particularly yeah. effective MP, is, is very troublesome for the Liberals. Yeah, and, and, and an L MP who's, I, I think, pretty well liked across the board, too, in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. that, that sort of uh, focuses the mind. And I wonder, Chantal, too, whether another question could be, uh, is there, was there an impression that this kind of report was not something that needed to be seen or wanted to be seen? Uh, by the Prime Minister and, and his office. I, like, I don't know, but, but th those are the kinds of things that the opposition can start feeding into. Well, for sure, uh, this has been a field day for, for the opposition parties. Yeah. The government failing to get on top of the narrative, always in reactive mode. Uh, and um, first point on this specific file, it yeah. makes it look uh, like hostage diplomacy worked. Uh, that the two mm. Michaels and what happened is spooked Canada into doing what it should normally do. Uh, and that's not the message you want to send. But in the larger picture, I don't think it's so much he said, she said, who did what, or was there a conspiracy to not do right. anything because right. it was a conser uh, conservative. But it goes to government competence, and that is much uh, more lethal for a government seeking a fourth term that the perception that it's incompetent, that it can't tie its shoelaces uh, on its mm -hmm. own, uh, permeates and, and eventually reaches voters in the sense uh, that they say, well, these guys are just not up to the job or no longer up to the job. Well, uh, well that goes to my sort of first question, Althea. Like, why can't the government get a handle on this in terms of uh, telling people what they know or, or showing what actions they're taking or any part of it? We're, we're talking about it again and again and again. Well, they can't seem to get a handle on it because it doesn't sound like the inputs uh, where they're getting their information is to be trusted. I mean, I don't know who told the prime minister that CSIS had not moved that up the chain of command, but he obviously felt confident enough with the information that he went out to publicly declare it. You know, if that's the case, then it kind of it makes you doubt if you're the leader of the government about the inputs of the sources of information you're getting. So I think that there's a lot more to the story that we probably don't understand at the moment. Um, I will say to Kelly's point, I don't have a problem with the Foreign Affairs Minister explaining uh, the process. I would rather, frankly, have like the Public Safety Minister in the House of Commons earlier this week explain why he couldn't say whether or not the government knew uh, when they read it. He could have said, I learned it reading the Globe and Mail, but we are checking to make sure that mm -hmm. you know something then fall through the cracks. I would much rather have the government explain how it gets to its decisions than to obfuscate and look like it's hiding or you know allow us to fill the blanks because there is no information right. um, or the opposition, right? So I, I don't have a problem with that. And the, taking their time to assess whether or not um, how big the consequences will be about taking this diplomatic action is not necessarily a bad thing either. Ward Alcock was telling me on our podcast a few weeks ago that um, when Canada expelled 12 Russian diplomats, the Russians retaliated in the same way. They expelled people who hadn't even yeah. entered Russia yet, and it set back foreign affairs, uh, Russia program, uh, it, it decimated basically that program. So. We have a lot of commercial interests in China. There's a lot of stuff happening in China that we, all three of us, probably don't know. Um, four of us. <laughs> I guess I could include myself in that. Uh, so it, it is consequential. And I don't know that we have a good idea what the consequences are at this point. And clearly the government doesn't either. But, but the political consequences in the meantime, Kelly, persist, right? If you, if you take no action, uh, then the political consequences for the government become difficult. 
Yeah, my concern about the Foreign Affairs Minister talking about whether they can expel has to do with laying cards on the ta table, maybe giving Chinese embassy officials a chance to lobby on this yeah. or to, yeah. to counter the argument. And what happens if she doesn't expel now? Um, you know, it, it could be seen as a sign of weakness. And I think we're hearing this narrative that it has to evolve. Even um, Alexandra uh, Trudeau uh, talking about how things were different uh, yeah. eight years ago in terms sure. of Canada's view of China. So I think we're seeing a narrative evolve that, yes, we didn't maybe fully realize the extent of how China has changed, but now we are. And I think that's going to become part of the messaging as well. La last quick word to you, to, to you, Chantal. I tried to think this afternoon. I've covered a few governments. I don't think I've ever covered a government that had so much trouble communicating basic facts for its own survival. Uh, it, it's a mystery to me why uh, you would be asked 12 times uh, as security public safety minister, did you know, when did you know, and you wouldn't be able to give the kind of answer that uh, Antia has given. And these guys have been in government for eight years. They still think they communicate well, but they're getting worse at it rather than better. Okay. On that note, we will leave things there. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. And with that, I'll send things back to Adrian in London. Thank you, Rosie. Next, examining the monarchy's ties to the slave trade. The royals were way more involved than I initially actually thought. King Charles offers support for more research, but will it be enough? Next. of King Charles has sparked a critical conversation about the royal family's role in the slave trade. Chris Brown spoke with researchers who've been granted rare access to some historical documents that detailed how the monarchy benefited. For most of the last 400 years, proof that a succession of British kings and queens grew rich off slavery has slowly trickled out of the reams of documents in the country's archives. Well, it's the Royal African Company Charter. But of late, King Charles has provided PhD student Camilla de Koning and her advisor, Professor Edmund Smith, with a new and unexpected opening to finally get the full story. One of the things was the company set up to do, does the charter make that clear? It makes it very clear. And slave people were very prominent in this. Once again, as you can see, listed under commodities, so they were not seen as people, but as a good. Owning slaves was never legal under British law, but in a cynical, deliberate loophole, for 150 years, trading in slaves was. It says so explicitly in the careful calligraphy of the charter of the Royal African Company. It was granted by the last king named Charles, Charles II in 1663. I mean, these goals were the goals of the royal family. Not only investing in, they were heavily engaged with how this company was uh, practicing their business. King William III received shares in the Royal African Company. His successor, George I, was also a shareholder, and his descendant, George IV, was a proponent of using slaves on Caribbean sugar plantations. And that only scratches the surface of what research is turning up. And the takeaways is that I think that the royals were way more involved than I initially actually thought. On visits to Africa, Charles has appeared very aware of the damage that slavery has inflicted. The appalling atrocity of the slave trade and the unimaginable suffering it caused left an indelible stain on the history of our world. Still, it made headlines when the palace announced just last month that the king is personally supporting de Koning's research and will ensure the collections at royal palaces are made available to her. Charles's evolution towards a more honest discussion mirrors a broader shift in British society over the legacy of slavery. The city of Bristol, once a hub for the slave trade, has been at the centre of it. So this is where the statue of Edward Colston once stood. Edson Burton has researched the transatlantic slave trade and the local men who became wealthy off of it, including Edward Colston. And he's everywhere here, is he? So he is everywhere here. Beacon Tower, was actually Colston Tower. We're on Colston Avenue. So 
Colston Hall was named in his honor. For a long time, most people here overlooked Colston's dreadful business practices and believed his philanthropy, supporting schools and hospitals, was how he should be remembered. But then came Black Lives Matter, and his statue became a target. As I was watching, we saw the statue literally sail from the plinth and land on the ground. The angry crowd dragged it to the water's edge, where Colston's slave boats once tied up and dumped it in. And it was that moment where you feel like you're standing on one side of history in another. The debate here now is about what kind of statue belongs where Colston once stood and what best reflects Bristol's complicated past. The process of renewal has been going on for much of my lifetime, halting, stuttering, sometimes crashing. But the idea that a monarch needs to feel that they are actually in tune with a new nation, not with just the conservation of an old identity, but how can we arrive at the consensus of an identity going forward? The king's evolution, though, doesn't go far enough for Cleo Lake, a Bristol activist who used to go to a school that still bears Colston's name. She wants the monarchy to pay reparations to the descendants of slaves. Reparations is about repair and also restoration. Returning the people who you've harmed as close as you can to when they wouldn't have been harmed. At the archives, the researchers don't want the question of reparations to overshadow this unique opportunity to pursue their royally sanctioned detective work. Chris, do you actually think that Charles's uh, decision to get involved now, as he has, marks any kind of turning point? I think people who wanted to see Charles push this issue forward are pleased with that. But Camille de Koning says for her it's less of a turning point, more of a starting point, because mm -hmm. there are these collections with so much detail about the links between uh, the monarchy and slavery uh, that not just her, but researchers who follow her can now really start to get a much more fulsome picture. All right, Chris Brown, thank you. Thanks. When I spoke with King Charles' sister, Princess Anne, in our exclusive interview, I asked her about his tacit support for researching the links between the monarchy and slavery. She gave a curious response. He said, absolutely, have a look. Well, you know more than I do, because I rather suspect that was the media's interpretation of that mm. particular deal. What's your who sense knows of it? who came up with that idea? You can catch the rest of that conversation in full tomorrow. It airs at 7.30 p.m. local time on CBC Television and 7.30 Eastern on CBC Explore. Next, a high-flying achievement that made broadcast history. So when the CBC aired it, they called it a live event, and that was the first time in history that that had been accomplished. How a Canadian fighter pilot helped bring the last coronation to Canadian screens in our mind. On this second day of June, in the year 1953, Elizabeth is led here in solemn procession this moment, 70 years ago, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II was a North American broadcast first, a major global event televised in Canada on CBC the same day as it was happening here in London, before satellites and broadband made that instantly possible. And it happened because of a top secret mission involving the Royal Air Force and a Canadian fighter pilot. Operation Pony Express is our moment. Uh, my father's brother was George Nickerson, was a wing commander in the Royal Canadian Air Force, and he was part of Operation Pony Express, which flew the tapes of the Queen's coronation that the BBC had filmed to North America. The um, top secret meetings were held as to the logistics. The canisters were put on a bomber aircraft. The bomber crew flew those first tapes over to Gander, Newfoundland, where my uncle sat in his CF-100 jet, where they were flown to Quebec, airlifted over to uh, Montreal, where the CBC aired the uh, coronation of the Queen. So when the CBC aired it, they called it a live event. And that was the first time in history that that had been accomplished. The Duke of Edinburgh kneels before the Queen. There was actually a competition 
between the American broadcaster, the NBC network. But as it turned out, the CBC was the one that pulled it off. In 1953, CBC scooped the American networks with the first pictures of the Queen's coronation. Nobody had sort of done that sort of thing before. Our family's very, very proud to be part of it. I think it's a heritage moment. It's interesting to hear what he says, that, that it was called a live event then because it happened on the same day with only a delay of a few hours. That's what made it history. But what you're about to see on Saturday is genuinely a live event. The first time a British coronation will be broadcast live immediately, instantly around the world. It will be happening early. You can join me Saturday bright and early at, as the big event gets underway. We'll begin at about 4 a.m. Eastern. Ian Hannah Mansing will be with you tomorrow, continuing our coverage of the coronation of King Charles from right here in London. That is The National for May the 4th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.